Pearl, it is such a privilege to be in conversation with you. Uh, it's inspiring for me. Uh, Thank you. I have been an admirer of your work for such a long time. And this is a moment, quite frankly, for me to celebrate you, to give you your flowers, uh, and to bask in your light and wisdom. So thank you for being here. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm such a fan of your work, including We Speak Your Names. Um, it's a poem that I just treasure and cite often. And so I'd really love to hear from you. What inspired you to write the poem? The poem came about because Oprah Winfrey was doing an event to honor 25 legendary African-American women. Um, and then she was inviting 45 younger women, who she was calling the youngins, um, <laughs> to come and honor these amazing, amazing women. So she asked me if I thought I could write something um, on behalf of the youngins for these legendary women. And I said, of course, are you kidding? What a dream assignment, of course I can. So she sent me the list of these women. And I realized that these were all women that I could talk about for pages and pages and pages. But what I was trying to do with the poem was actually to get to the essence of what we would want to say to these amazing women, to tell them how grateful we are for the work that they've done and for the strength that they've shown um, and just for all of the ways that they showed us how to do it. Whatever it is that we're doing, they showed us how to do that. Um, and my husband, who is also a writer, was very helpful to me because he said, think about it like church. Think about it like call and response. Oh, You're that. talking to them and you want them to hear you so that they can respond back. So that that was very helpful because I grew up, I'm a minister's daughter. So it, it really became a um, kind of a praise song to these women. I think I felt that. It's so it's so interesting to hear you describe it in that way. Um, there was something that brought you in. Yes. And you wanted to engage with the stories. Um, with the verses in a way that does have a reminiscence of church. Mm -hmm. And I'd not thought about it in that way before. And I think that's part of what culturally what we do, you know, is we want to embrace the people that we honor. We don't want to put them on a pedestal. We want to embrace them. We want to sing to them. We want to have them in the middle of the circle so we can dance around them, all of those things. And I really was hoping that I could get the, the essence of that kind of cultural specificity um, in a poem to these to these amazing women. A praise and worship song, in essence, was exactly. the poem, which is probably one of the many reasons it continues to speak to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As a person of faith, uh, it gave me great faith. Mm -hmm. um, faith in the women who've come before me, faith in my own presence as a woman, and faith in the future of the women who will come behind me. Uh, so just a beautiful gift that you've delivered to all of us. Thank you. And it was so it was so important to them because I think we don't realize that a lot of these people that we think know how much we love them, they really don't. So that when seven of us youngins got to read this poem to these amazing women at a, a luncheon in the afternoon, many of them cried. They couldn't believe that we, the younger women that they were hoping their work had inspired, were having a chance to tell them that. So that, you know, I'll, I'll never forget watching Leontine Price sitting there crying with Mariah Carey. You know, I mean, things where you would never think of people um, at the same table sharing the same information. And Leontine Price had said something to uh, Mariah about having seen one of her videos and enjoying her song. Mariah was a wreck, you know, she, <laughs> she couldn't deal with it. <laughs> Janet Jackson was crying. People were just moved by the fact of all of that sisterhood mm -hmm. right there together. The power of the sisterhood. It was. And a lovely reminder to tell people how much they mean to you. Yes. While they're living. Yes. Give the flowers while they're living. It's a yes. beautiful love letter to life. Yeah. And in that spirit, could I ask you to perhaps share um, a few of the passages from the poem that you really love? I would love to. I would really love to. I feel like this poem calls the spirits in, so we can call the spirits in. Because we are free women, born of free women, who are born of free women back as far as time begins, we celebrate your freedom. Because we are wise women born of wise women who are born of wise women, we celebrate your wisdom. Because we are strong women born of strong women who are born of strong women, we celebrate your strength. 
because we are magical women, born of magical women, who are born of magical women. We celebrate your magic. My sisters, we are gathered here to speak your names. We are here because we are your daughters as surely as if you had conceived us, nurtured us, carried us in your wombs, and then sent us out into the world to make our mark and see what we see and be what we be, but better, truer, deeper, because of the shining example of your own incandescent lives. We are here to speak your names because we have enough sense to know that we did not spring full blown from the forehead of Zeus or arrive on the scene like Topsy, our sister once removed, who somehow just growed. We know that we are walking in footprints made deep by the confident strides of women who parted the air before them like the forces of nature that you are. We are here to speak your names because you taught us that the search is always for the truth and that when people show us who they are, we should believe them. We are here because you taught us that sister speak can continue to be our native tongue, no matter how many languages we learn as we move about as citizens of the world and of the ever evolving universe. We are here to speak your names because of the way you made for us, because of the prayers you prayed for us. We are the ones you conjured up, hoping we would have strength enough and discipline enough and talent enough and nerve enough to step into the light when it turned in our direction and just smile a while. We are the ones you hope would make you proud because all of your hard work makes all of yours part of something better truer, deeper, something that lights the way ahead like a lamp unto our feet, as steady as the unforgettable beat of our collective heart. We speak your names. We speak your names. We speak your names. Ooh. <laughs> a meditation for my heart and my soul. Thank you. Literally, I have tears in my eyes. I love that poem. Thank you. Love that poem. I have spent so much of my um, career since I was presented that beautiful poem, even carrying it around with me mm -hmm. as I've been on the road traveling. Uh, the book, I have my copy, one of the many copies <laughs> that I, I own uh, with me, and I'm able to call upon it as a source of strength and inspiration. And so to hear it um, spoken by you is, is so phenomenally moving <laughs> to me. I can't even begin to tell you. Um, it's a moment that I will never, never forget. Oh, so, thank you. Thank you, thank you. And you might have noticed I was at times closing my eyes, like literally meditating on it because it's just served me so well. You know, there's things that when I write them, it's like you have to do the hard work. Writing is very hard work. I love it, but it's, it's very hard work. And there's some things where you have to work to get to it Whatever it is in your imagination, whatever it is in your heart, you have to really work hard to get it. Once I had had conversation with Oprah about this poem, conversation with my husband about some of the things I could think of shaping this poem, I wrote this in like less than two hours. What? It, it, was, um, it was like all there in me, needing a vehicle to come out so that it can be offered not only to them, but to you on those planes, doing what you were trying to do, to other people who have honored the women in their family by using this poem, so that it, it oftentimes will take a long time between when you have the idea and you say, oh, that's what I'm trying to do, and you get it on paper. This one did not. Once I realized that this was really what I wanted to do, it was two hours and it was done. It was done. I shocked to hear that yeah, one because it's, it's still shocking to me I mean, because so often we hear about the creative process and as you've said writing is hard it's it's um, a practice and a discipline to be able to create um, whether it's a novel or a play or whatever your particular creative expression is and so I'm intrigued to hear you tease that out a bit more how is it that some bodies of work might take months or years to produce and others like this once you were ready, it came out in two hours. What do you think I think a magic? lot of that has to do with how much you understand what you're trying to say. 
Um, when I write, often what I'm doing is answering a question that's driving me crazy. And what I have learned is, if it's driving me crazy, it's probably driving you crazy too. It's probably driving a lot of other women crazy as well. So that what I'm always trying to do is get to the right question. What am I trying to answer, articulate the question for myself? And then once I get to what that question is, I can create a journey for some characters that can look at that question, can examine that question. And if it's a play, you can see the question might take the characters um, through conflict with each other, conflict with other people, but then they get to a moment where as the playwright, as the writer, I get to kind of answer that question. Um, Blues for an Alabama Sky um, is a question really about telling the truth. You know, Angel is such a destructive force and a great character. I loved writing about her, but I wouldn't want to be her friend. Yeah, she, she was a hot tells mess. The truth. She, she was a hot mess. <laughs> always, because she makes every single decision in that play. Yeah. Every decision she makes is based on fear. And our worst decisions in our lives, the worst decisions that we make are the decisions that are based on fear because then we're not really thinking clearly. We're worried about things, we're afraid of something. So that what I'm always trying to do as a writer is get to the question. What is the question that I'm trying to answer? And then find the characters who can help me answer it. For this poem, it was less the question and more how am I going to articulate all the things I feel for these women. I mean, from Dorothy Height to Diana Ross. I mean, how am I gonna talk about what they meant to me? Because I know if I honestly can talk about what it meant to me to be growing up in Detroit in my high school, three blocks from Motown. And you know, the Motown music was the soundtrack of our lives, really. How does that translate into a poem where I get to say to Diana Ross, thank you? How can I say to Mrs. King, you know, because people talk about Dr. King, but Mrs. King was there every step of the way. How do I say to Mrs. King, thank you for your courage. Thank you for not only being there as a part of his work, but for having your own work that you carried forward until you joined the ancestors. How do you do that? And that became a, a moment of realizing that it was a praise song. It was an opportunity for me to speak for all of us and just say one big thank you. We love you, don't stop. We see you and we look at everything that you do and it makes us stronger. And when you're not feeling as strong, just know that we are there. We're there for you, we're there with you because they've given us everything. And this opportunity was my chance to say to them, we've received it, thank you, and we're stronger because of it. Beautiful, absolutely beautiful. I'm really intrigued by the notion that you articulated of what's the question you're trying to answer. And it's such a great way to frame um, whether you are um, a creative or someone in business, because even in the business world in which I've worked for some 30 odd years, we're often talking about, you know, what question are we trying to answer? What problem are we trying to solve or opportunity that we can unlock? And so getting really clear about uh, what problem you're trying to solve or question you're trying to answer creates, I think, simplicity and focus in a way that does allow you to, I think, listen, learn, and co-create a solution. Mm -hmm. um, that and we can often can't, can't get to the question so that we end up arguing about things that aren't really what we're trying to talk about. And it's in the American theater now because I'm primarily a playwright. And in the American theater, there is lots of discussion, lots of arguing, lots of trying to figure out how do we do it? How do we make all of these theaters reflect America? in the best possible way so that we don't have this is a white theater, this is a black theater, this is a Latinx theater, this is an Asian theater. These are all American theaters. What does that mean to tell an American story? And I didn't grow up that way. I grew up in Detroit, Michigan in a black nationalist, separatist, very political household. So the idea of thinking of myself as an American playwright with the right to tell any American story and the right to embrace any American story was a journey for me. I didn't truly feel like an American in that sense of this is my country, I embrace it, until Barack Obama was in the White House. And I think Michelle Obama was a good part of that for me too, because it's like, oh my goodness, 
a black woman is in the White House raising two little black girls. Yeah. How can I not claim that? With her black that? mama. How can I not be, that's right, with her mama to help her. Mm -hmm. How can I not embrace that? How can I not understand that that story is not a black girl story? That's an American girl story. These theaters are not doing black plays, white plays, Latinx plays. They're doing American plays. And if we, as artists, as writers, can figure out how to understand that and understand that our stories can be understood by anybody, then it enlarges everything. It gives us a bigger palette to work on. It gives the audience a bigger uh, space to learn. I have had plays done in theaters where um, women will come to me afterward, white women, and say, oh my God, that character sounded just like my grandmother. <laughs> and this will be a black grandmother in the play. And my response to that is, isn't it wonderful? All grandmothers sound alike. They all want the same thing for their grandbabies. You know, as writers, we don't tell a million stories. We tell love stories, we tell war stories, we tell family stories, because they're all the same all over the world. We're all talking about the same thing. How do we live in peace? How do we fall in love? How do we grow old in a neighborhood where you can wave at your neighbors and not be afraid to sit on the porch? And that's the power of the arts, I think, as we talk about you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion today. The art and cultural community can play such a powerful role and helping us understand the things that we have in common and ways to celebrate our differences. Yes. Um, and that narrative that comes through the stories that uh, great artists like you share, I think are such an important part of the journey that we're on to fully realize our potential um, as one community in this country and around the globe. So here's to the artists like you, who I think are also helping us to um, build more empathy an understanding that I hope ultimately leads to more action um, and more civility, quite frankly, in the world. So, mm -hmm. okay, I'd like to expand our conversation a bit, if I may. You are an accomplished essayist, novelist, playwright, poet. You've done so many amazing things. And so I'm going to ask you what may feel like an impossible question. So bear with me. Is there one of your works that you would say is your favorite? And if so, why? I can't really say um, because I learn something with every piece. Um, I learn something. I learn the answer to those questions um, that I'm that I'm always talking about. But it's like asking me to pick among children. You know, pick among grandchildren. Who's yes. your favorite? Say, well, I like her because she does this. I like him because he does this. And I feel that way about my work. Um, I learn something with every piece, not only as a, as a writer, because I always learn something as a writer. Sometimes when I see my plays that are 20 years old now, I say, oh, I could have fixed that. I'm a better playwright now. I'm a better novelist now. I could do this better. And then I realize that's not the point. The point is not making every piece perfect because that leads to censorship for a writer because you won't let it out till it's perfect. Let it out. The important thing is to create a body of work and that you learn with every piece um, better, how to do it better, how to think more clearly, um, how to ask the real questions, how to talk about those questions to an audience so that I've learned something with every single piece that I've done with the novels, um, with the plays. I think the, the forms that I work in teach me a lot too. Um, I love writing novels because you have so much space. You can take the people anywhere you want. You can go over years of time. In a play, you can't really do that because you've got less than two hours. People want to go So home. do you prefer writing novels or do you prefer no, writing plays or theater. you love them all? Theater. Theater is your theater. love. I love theater. I love the expansive palette that is available to a novelist, but it's lonesome. You write it by yourself. People read it by themselves. With a play, you write it by yourself and then you go into rehearsal and you're in a tribe of other creative people, designers, directors, actors, and it becomes a group, a family, dedicated to telling this story that you've created by yourself, telling this story to the audience, which is the final piece in theater of the collaboration. So I, I love theater the most because it's, it's the best of both worlds. It's the solitary time you need, but it's also that time with a tribe when you're actually able to do it together. So on opening night, you're all there together with your fingers crossed, <laughs> hoping that everything goes well. Well, in fact, as you've spoken about this, you've talked about the power of spoken words. 
right? Um, especially considering that everyone doesn't like to read or can read. Um, and I think you've understood the assignment as a playwright to really make words accessible, right, to the audience. Um, I've heard you liken it to gathering around a campfire, which I think is a beautiful way. And to I frame always it. think that because when people ask me, do you think theater is going to, you know, disappear in another couple of years? Because we've all got little phones, and you know, we can access everything, movies, everything. We don't need the theater. And my response always is, we've always done theater human beings. Before we did anything, when we finally learned to make fire, what did we do? <laughs> we sat in a circle around that fire and told the stories of our tribe. What's a good man? What's a good woman? What's a family? Who's a hero? Who's a shero? That's what we did. Yeah. And that's still what we do in the theater. Yeah. So it's, it's ancient and it's not going anywhere. Well, can you talk a bit more about the power of the spoken word and, and what might be the duty and even the responsibility of storytellers, perhaps even all of us, to choose our words wisely. I think choosing your words wisely is so important um, because people say things without thinking and they set in motion things that they haven't considered. Um, so it's always necessary to think deeply before you speak. Um, make sure that you're saying something that's true. Make sure that you're saying something that's compassionate that understands that everybody's doing the best they can. And sometimes when we look at people, we don't see that, but most human beings are doing the best they can. But for me, the power of spoken language came from my dad, who was a wonderful minister, great preacher, and who would read all of these very complicated history and political um, tomes. And then on Sunday morning, he was able to translate all of that into the language of ordinary, hardworking people on the west side of Detroit, Michigan. And I would watch him because I adored my father. So I would follow him around girl. and I would, oh, <laughs> I would watch him reading. I would watch him thinking about things. And he would talk to me about what he was reading. And I'm 10 years old and he's talking to me about The Wretched of the Earth by Franz Fanon. And I'm saying, okay, I'm going to act like I understand because I want him to keep talking to me. But then on Sunday morning, I would hear him translate all of that complex history and political history and all of that into the language people could understand. And as a playwright, I think that's still what I do. I never want people to have to have a PhD to understand my plays. I want regular folks who are doing their jobs. My job is to make sure that the stories I'm telling them are accessible, which doesn't mean you have to talk down to people, which just means that you can't do that thing that writers sometimes do. I'm gonna prove how smart I am. I'm gonna use these words. I'm gonna use this kind of story because I want people to know how smart I am. I think that's, that's a waste of time. And I think it's a good lesson for all of us, regardless mm -hmm. of your profession. You don't have to prove that you're the smartest one in the room to take things that are complex and make them simple, right. to make them accessible and understandable so that people can translate them um, in ways that make it. their lives better and use it. Yeah. Is a and gift. use it. There's yeah. no point if you're talking to people and they can't use what exactly. you say. They can't understand it and take it with them. And I'm sure it's true in business as well. Yeah. You want people to understand what you're saying yeah. so they can take it, say it to someone else, mm -hmm. and pass it on, pass mm -hmm. it on. And it, it, it creates, a, I think, a sense of belonging when you can have shared language, shared understanding, shared purpose. And so the ability to choose your words wisely um, is such an important lesson. I often talk about the right message, audience, vehicle, timing, and tone, because you really want people to be able to hear what it is that you're saying um, and receive it. Yes. Um, even if they don't uh, agree with it, Yes. at least they've received it in a way that exactly. um, can create a connection of some sort. And that's so important. Sometimes we feel like the conversation can't be over until we win and they agree. And that takes forever. And that. Um, creates a kind of a power dynamic where I'm going to force you to believe what I believe. I don't necessarily want you to believe what I believe, but I want you to understand why I believe it. And I want to understand why you believe what you believe. And then we can talk rather than trying to arm wrestle each other into who's right and who's wrong. Mm -hmm. Well, it's such a skill to be able to surround yourself with people who um, have divergent points of view uh, and to be able to suspend judgment and just listen and try to appreciate where the other person is coming from as a foundation for being able to move forward, which we need more of in the country and around the world right now, I would say. And you said something that's so important, which is suspend judgment. 
We're so busy judging everybody and judging ourselves. We're so hard on ourselves, so then we're hard on everybody else. Yes, yes, and you have yes. To, yeah. <laughs> Did I get an amen? Yes, That's girl. Right. Well, you have to say, I'm not going to be, I'm going to be loving to myself so that I can be loving to other people. Because you can't be hard on yourself and not be hard on other people because it's, it's the same energy. Another meditation. I'm going to be loving to myself so that I can be loving to others is a wonderful, wonderful message. You know, Pearl, I believe that we all have a purpose, something that we're called to do on this earth. Um, I read that you felt like you knew you wanted to be a writer as early as two or three years old. How could you have <laughs> known that at such an early age? Like, I really would love to know. <laughs> um, I was always telling stories. I have a sister who's two years older. So I remember standing in a crib, so I was about two, she was four, and I was trying to tell her a story, and she stopped to listen to me. And I remember at two years old thinking to myself, I am really killing this. I made a four-year-old stop and listen to me. So I told her, um, you know, I said, I blame you for all of this, because if you had just walked on, who knows how that would have affected what I was doing, but I always told stories. Um, when I realized there was such a thing as a writer, you know, I was like, well, that's me. That's what I want to do. And I started writing um, in little notebooks. My grandfather would buy me these little notebooks about that big that you get from the drugstore, little pencils, and I would be writing in my Journals notebook and, and it was stories stories I wanted to tell stories and by that time I had tormented my poor sister to teach me how to read because she learned how to read before I did I realized that adults could read it hadn't occurred to me that little kids could read <laughs> and I saw my sister reading and I was outraged I said You're like, I want to read I want to read you can read and I can't read so my sister taught me how to read oh, when I was about four. beautiful and I then I started keeping those little notebooks and I would love to have have them just to see what I was writing down at four years old but they were stories I wanted to tell stories about people you know I used to ride the bus in Detroit with my sister and we'd be eight ten years old and I would always have my little notebook and I'd be writing down what people were saying on the bus because I wanted to be able to write the way people actually mm. talk and it was funny because men don't talk a lot on the bus <laughs> women talk a lot on the bus <laughs> So and you are hearing they, some good stuff. Mostly what they talk about is men. I'd be uh, writing it down and I'd think to myself, if my mother had ever uh, looked at what I was writing down, she would have said, you will not go on the bus ever wow. anymore. But it helped me listen because if I'm going to write plays, mm -hmm. I have to make sure that the people on the stage sound like real people. Yeah, 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 in the right voice. In the right voice. The worst thing anyone can ever say to a playwright is, real people don't talk like that. And then you know it's just, you didn't, you didn't do it. Um, so that you have to always be listening to people. If you're an actor, you have to be watching people because it's, you can't be bored. We're watching human beings live out their lives and they can't all write the story of what happened last week. They can't write a novel about what happened to them last year. So as writers, that's what we have to do. So writing is your purpose? Would you say oh, yes. that your purpose is writing? Yes. So how have you been able to use that purpose to help navigate your life and career over time? Well, journals are a big part of, of my mental health. I write in my journals every day. Um, I don't have a, an assignment for my journals. I write whatever's on my mind. Sometimes it'll be something I've heard, a conversation, um, but a lot of times it'll be just whining. I'm mad about this. You know, I don't want to do this, whatever it so is. So instead of cussing somebody out, you'll write it down? I write it all down. Okay, I have write to take it down. notes. And then I'll have to I'm take done. notes and do that. Then I'm done. So it's, but the, the idea of being able to tell somebody a story that helps them see something more clearly, helps them see themselves more clearly, has always appealed to me because I know that's how I get most of the information that I get in the world is from stories. My husband sat at our house one time, we were watching something about the Vietnam War. And he said, you know, this country has always been at war. And he went through and named every war that the country has been in and the year. And I was so taken aback by that because that's not the way my mind organizes information. It's like you ask me about the Civil War, I got stories about that. You ask me about World War I, I got stories about that. He was thinking chronologically. He was, his mind right? organizes things in that way. And you so that I don't, stories. I don't do it. The idea of being able to list every American president, every war, every state and the capitals, my mind doesn't work like that. My mind is like, wow, North Dakota, 
What if I was a woman living in North Dakota? What if I looked at that mountain with all those carvings on it? What about, so that my mind instantly goes to stories, not dates and time. Mm -hmm. But I think that the ability that I have is to channel my curiosity um, and my absolute admiration and awe for human beings were so endlessly interesting to me. You know, people get bored when they're in line at the post office or in line at whatever it is. I'm never bored. I'm watching people. How did she say that? You're what making up stories say? wherever you are. Wherever I go. <laughs> it used to drive my poor daughter crazy. We'd be walking through the mall, she's looking for a pair of shoes, and I'm saying, I wonder what that woman is thinking when she and my daughter would be like. I love we it. We are buying shoes today, Mom. We are not I making up it. stories. But, but that's what I do, and I've always done it. Stories. So I think it, mm. it came here with me, mm -hmm. um, and I'm just so grateful that I grew up in a family that nurtured it, you know, and, and helped me understand that that was a valuable a purpose in life. Stories are such a great artifact of our lives. Um, and we all have stories. I think so many of us struggle though to share our stories. And, and to think our stories are worth sharing. Yes. We don't think our stories are worth it. And that's why when people see people who are like them on the stage, it validates for them that the story of their life might be as worthy as the story that I chose to tell or Dominique Morso chose to tell or, you know, um, any of the playwrights um, that are writing, Lynn Nottage, August Wilson. These are stories, but if people can see themselves in it, they will value their own stories more deeply. Agreed. You know, as you've transitioned through various stages of your life, I think you've always been able to find and share stories and your voice, which I think is really, really powerful. And in fact, in your book, The Things That I Should Have Told My Daughter, I think brings that to life as does so much of your work. And so I'm curious, how have you done that? And what advice do you have for us about finding and sharing our voice um, throughout the various stages of our lives when our voice may actually be evolving? I think that, of course, our voices are evolving because our lives are evolving. Everything about us is growing every day, whether we recognize it or not. But I think the thing that's always been important to me is to find a way to tell the truth. I was less concerned with identifying voice and more concerned with how can I give myself permission to tell the truth that I know. Because many of us will get to a truth, we know it's true, but we're scared to tell it. And that's when we start stifling that voice. How do you work through the fear of speaking and telling the truth so that the truth um, can come out? You have to just be brave. You have to find other people who want to hear what you have to say. Um, surround yourself as much as you can with people who encourage you to tell the truth. If you're surrounded by people who want you to lie, then you'll learn to lie and you will learn that that's the way to move through the world. So that what you find is if you can start to tell the truth, more people want you to do that than want you to lie. You know, when people will say, wow, you write such personal things, I can't believe that you could say that out loud. And what I always say is, but you heard it, right? You don't think less of me because I told the truth about it's myself. So vulnerable, Pearl, to be able to speak truths that share the sort of warts in your life as but well as the joys in your it life doesn't. is because scary. It, when you do it and you're thinking that it's sharing something that's like a wart something so terrible when you go to the grocery store and somebody stops you in the produce and says can i just hug you because when i read that in your book saw that in your play whatever it was it was me it humanizes and I was afraid to say it i think it humanizes yes us. and it's bravery we think yeah. that it it's vulnerability where now I've said these things about me and people will think less of me. Mm -hmm. I have never had anyone come to me and say, you know, I read that book about, you know, things I should have told my daughter and you were doing this and doing that and I don't like you anymore. I think you're terrible. I thought more of you. Because I was telling the you truth. You were telling the That's truth why. and you were Not humanizing Not because of any it. specific craziness that I was doing, because all of us do craziness. It made my craziness seem, you know, you know Normal. Normal. <laughs> because we all do it. We're all, and that's actually why I wrote that book. Because young women were, were coming to me and meeting me when I was 60, 65, when I had gotten things together and I seemed to be so serene and organized. And they're saying, oh my goodness, I wish I could be like you. And I'm saying, you're 22. You're going to be a hot mess for, for a, a long while. time. So just <laughs> deal with it. Yeah. Don't feel ashamed of it. Protect yourself. Be yourself. 
But don't feel like at 22, you can be like you're going to be at 40 or 50 or 60. We're all a work in progress. We're all, and we have to do it. We have to be brave enough to realize that when you tell the truth, people will embrace it. They will not reject it. And people that reject the truth are toxic get from around them. They're not good for you. Amen. But most people that you, that you are able to train yourself to tell the truth to, they want to hear it. And the more you do it, the easier it gets, the easier it gets. You don't have to remember anything. When you lie, you have to remember everything. Yeah, that's the hard Who part. Who did I tell this to and exactly. what did I say happened and all that? When you tell the truth all the time, you don't have to remember because what you're going to say is what actually happened and more important than what happened, how you feel about it, what you feel, what you bring. You have to validate for yourself what those feelings are. And journals are good for that. Meditation is good for that. All those things that allow us to still those voices in your head. I was reading a, a Buddhist teacher one time and he said, you know, meditation is a way to bind the monkeys because there's monkeys in our head, just all those crazy ideas, and meditation is a way to bind the monkeys. And when I read that, I was bind just, the monkeys. I was all over the map. I said, <laughs> thank you, I need something to help me bind these monkeys. But if you can do it, then you begin to tell the truth as a matter of course, and you don't have to think about it anymore. Ooh, is this a situation where I will lie? And people will come to me sometimes if I talk about telling the truth and say, well, how about if, you know, somebody's going to kill somebody and all that? And I said, the thing is, that's an extreme example. Sure. If someone is going to kill somebody and you have to tell a lie to save that person, lie. Yeah. Go ahead and do it. But that's not when we lie. Yeah. Nobody's talking about those extreme yeah. situations. We're talking about currying favor with people, making people think you're someone that you're not because you don't think you're enough trying to do something that is not really true to you. More in the day to day. Someone else wants you to do it. So in extreme examples, if you got to save the person, save the innocent baby, of course, lie. But if that's not what we're talking about, tell the truth, because that's what saves us is the truth. I love that. That's what saves us is the truth. That's a drop the mic moment, right? <laughs> At a moment when people don't necessarily seem to want to hear the truth or want to create their own version of it. The truth will save us is a very powerful reminder. Thank you for that. Um, I'd be curious if you were sharing the truth with a younger version of yourself, um, what would you say? And I'll use this for a bit more context. Recently, I wrote a letter to my younger self. I called it a letter to little Leisha, um, trying to do some truth telling uh, to myself and reflect on the people, the places, the experiences that have shaped who I am. And so I'd be curious if you were to um, give some words of wisdom and speak the truth to little Pearl, what would you say? I would say, don't worry so much. It's going to be okay. <laughs> it's going to be okay. I'm a big worrier. I used to worry a lot and I still worry sometimes, but more now about the state of the world. Um, but don't worry so much um, and never lie. That's all. Don't do it. When you feel powerless, and many of us feel powerless, um, then we learn to lie to get around the people who we feel are more powerful. So I would, that's what my, my main things I think to my, to my little girl self would be, don't worry so much and don't ever lie. Don't make anyone so powerful that you feel like you have to lie to them. Tell the truth. You know, don't be afraid. Don't worry. Do it. You'll be fine. Oh, such great advice. It's, Sometimes you want to sort of rewind uh, the chapters in your life, and yet we can't do that. And yeah. so that reflection, though, I do think is healthy and cathartic and um, helps put you on a path to live and lead and love more fully mm -hmm. in the rest of the chapters uh, in your life. And so I'll be taking those lessons that you shared back and with me. And often when you write a letter to your 11-year-old self, what you wrote to yourself when you were 11 is probably good advice for you now. Yes. So that's the thing too. Sometimes we are, are more willing to talk to our baby girl selves. And then when you look at it, you say, oh, I need to remember this now. I need to stop worrying. I need to be sure I remember how important the truth is because what we wanted to know then is what we still want to know. We want to feel it so deeply that it's a part of who we are every single day. I love that. I'm going to be baby girl, Laisha. Remember. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Let her tell you the truth. Let her tell you the truth. <laughs> Amen to that. Um, speaking of amazing women who I think have always spoken the truth, 
um, Mrs. Coretta Scott King is one of them. And so I'd love to spend a few moments talking about her um, and through the lens of a play that you wrote called A Song for Coretta. Uh, Coretta Scott King uh, was an extraordinary person. Um, so many people know her husband, the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, but she was a force in her own right and continued to do um, work around equity and justice after um, he was gone. And I was blessed to um, spend time with her, to know her well, and attended her funeral. And so the play is about fictional characters, mourners, who uh, are paying their respects to her. And it was very moving to me um, and brought back my own lived experience, uh, quite frankly, not only with her while she was living, but at that service. I'm curious, what led you to write that beautiful tribute to her? And what message were you trying to convey through that play? I admired Mrs. King um, so much. She actually was just putting the King Center together when I arrived in Atlanta in 1969. And my first job in Atlanta was working for her at the King Center. And I admired her um, for being able to continue to work for social justice. Um, even after the great sacrifice that she had made. Um, I admired her as a person. And when she died, they um, allowed people to come to Ebenezer um, to pay their respects. And people were in line in the rain, and it was cold. It was not a typical Atlanta day. It was cold, it was rainy, and the uh, news crew was there. And the guy had a big umbrella. And he was saying, we're out here and there's people standing in line to see Mrs. King. And I looked at all the people all the way around the block there on Auburn Avenue. And I thought to myself, who's in that line? Who are these people who want to say goodbye, we love you, to Mrs. King? Because that's the way my mind works. I'm looking for the story. So I put five women in that line, imaginary women, and said, let me just see what would happen if they were in line together. And they're all very different. You know, one is an old civil rights worker, one is a young wild child, one is someone who just came from New Orleans, one is a soldier getting ready to go back to war. But they all were moved by Mrs. King. Yeah, she was the connection. That she was the thing that, that brought them together because they admired her. They admired her ability to tell the truth. They admired her devoting her whole life to trying to help all of us. So that I wanted to, to pay tribute to her by allowing these women to talk about what she had meant to them rather than creating a, um, a character that was based on her. Because it's, I try not to do that um, because those are real people. Um, what I do is imagine people who are in the orbit around those real people. Mm. I, I loved it and was so moved by it. And I was one of those people. Uh, who admired her and so just really am grateful that you created such a lovely tribute to her uh, and a legacy for uh, all of the things that she did that deserve to be recognized and celebrated. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she had dreams too and um, I think this play keeps her legacy alive and allows it to live on through all of us. So I just, again, deeply grateful for oh, a beautiful thank you. tribute. She was something. Yes. She, mm -hmm. she was really was. Definitely something. I think about her every day, mm -hmm. quite frankly, every day. And, you know, as a follow up to that, uh, you've lived through decades of civil rights. And I'm curious what advice would you have for us as we continue to fight for and work for equity and social justice? My advice would be don't stop. Keep doing it. Don't stop. Don't have that moment where you get tired and say, I've done enough. Because you can't do enough till everybody's free. So we have to just keep doing it, keep doing it. And realize that, you know, I was talking about people making bad decisions based on fear. A lot of people in our country are afraid now because the country looks different. The country sounds different. There's more different kinds of people being allowed to pull up their chairs to the decision-making tables. And so there's a lot of fear um, afoot in our country. So bad decisions are being made. Violence is coming forward. But I think that's a transition moment. I think the most important thing is for us who believe that this country can be what this country says it is to keep pushing, 
to keep on doing the work that we have to do. And we don't have to make it all happen in two days. All we have to do is the work, the part, the journey that we can do. And then pass and, the baton. And pass it, and mm -hmm. then you have to do it, and then our children have to do it, and our grandchildren have to do it. Because the, the purpose is not to do it and then go home. The purpose is to continue to push it until it's right. And if it's not right for 100 years, then, then keep, we've got to work keep doing for 100 the work. years. Mrs. Right. King would always say that our rights are fought in one with each generation. Yeah. Right? That we yeah. all had work to do. Yes. Uh, in and this. we do. And to find joy in it. Mm. You know, to not say, okay, I'm going to be happy once everything is settled. You have to be happy in the struggle. You know, I always tell young people when they're like, wow, you were involved in anti-war struggling, feminist struggling, civil rights struggling. It's so hard. And I say, that's true. It's, it's hard work and it's dangerous work. But there are no better relationships than the ones forged on the front lines of trying to make change. Yes. There's no better love affairs that yes. ever bloom aside from in that moment when you're trying to change the world together. So don't think you're gonna have to give up great friendships and great love affairs and great passion. It's all there. That's a part of what it is. So struggle isn't a horrible sacrifice. It's a part of, of the life that you choose. And you can have all of the wonderful, passionate relationships that you want as a part of that struggle. I love that. There is joy and hope and love yes. amidst the struggle. Yes. Ugh, super inspiring. You know, our time is about to come to a close, so I'd love to ask you just a few rapid fire fun questions, okay. if I may. So, if you weren't a writer, what would you do? I can't imagine what I would do <laughs> if I wasn't a writer. I would probably teach, but I teach now. So I remember watching Betty Davis one time, the actress, and someone asked her, if you weren't an actress, what would you do? And she said, I probably would have married some man and driven him crazy. <laughs> and I think that's probably my answer, too. I probably would have driven that some people crazy. So fantastic. I'm very glad I'm a writer because I, I let people have their lives. <laughs> Okay, what's your favorite word? Work of writing? What's your favorite word? A word. What's your favorite word? My favorite word is truth because that's the biggest challenge. Um, from that comes everything. So I would say truth. Running neck and neck is love because that's, that's so important in every aspect of what we do. So I would say truth and love are, are right there together. I'll let you have two words, girl. Thank you. I'll, I'll take those Truth two. and love. There you I'll go. take those two. Those are fantastic. And finally, what brings you joy? My family is a great source of joy for me. I am crazy about my husband. I love my daughter madly. I love my five grandchildren. My sister lives in Atlanta. So I'm surrounded by family. Um, and also the, the wonderful blessing of being able to do the work I was born to do every day of my life. I wake up and I'm so grateful that the life that I have allows me to do the work I think I was born to do so that I think my family and my work, and I guess that's back to the love and truth, um, it's the same thing because they surround me um, with love and support um, and my work feeds me and makes me feel like I have a reason to get up and work every single day. Wow. I am so grateful that you've been called to do what you do because we are all the beneficiaries of it. This has been a gift that I fully received and I'm really looking forward to continuing to reading more of your work, seeing more of your work, <laughs> being inspired by you and your work. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah.